I just love being your pastor because I, I feel like that God is giving me things just for you. When I sit during the week and I feel like, you know, Lord, what do you want to speak uh, to our members this week? I feel like that he's giving me something. And I know it's not just for me to feed me. It does feed me a lot. I love it. Thank you, guys. <laughs> it feeds me too. But it's like God is giving me something that is for you. And I believe that God has given me something for this fall, like a sermon series. I'm not going to give it away already. I still roll this one over in my heart. Um, I believe that he has given me something for fall and something for spring next year already, something where he wants to get our church on track and to move us forward. And it's going to have, 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 have to do something with us personally, where we are, because when God wants to do something, he starts where? With ourselves. When God wants to change something, he starts where? He starts with our own, right? And so, and, and I believe God is doing something. And so, as I was praying, okay, I don't want to just launch it quite uh, now with our fall kickoff. Um, then when Pastor Jim came out last week, and he was just, pre it was good, was it? It was a fantastic sermon. We just were really blessed by him coming out and preaching to us. And then as I was standing here and listening to his sermon, I just felt something that, that God just dropped in my heart. And this is from Colossians and just the scripture that I remembered. And so I went back to it this week and God just really spoke to me. And it's something that um, I already put on, on Facebook um, that I could not wait to get out. So this is great. I really like it. Um, it's in Colossians chapter 2. And it's going to be an expositor sermon. Uh, you have different uh, styles of preaching. You ha can have a textual sermon or a topical sermon. This is going to be an expositor sermon, which basically means you stick with one portion of Scripture and just go really deep into it. Should we do that? An expositor sermon. So Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 8. And it sounds very simple. Uh, maybe let me just start... Uh, starting in chapter 2. For, uh, this is uh, the Apostle Paul writing, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea, and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ like that which is christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge listen if you look for knowledge if you look for wisdom in christ jesus we have all the 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 treasures hidden for all wisdom and knowledge and then he says and i say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments for though I am absent in the body, yet I am with you in the spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. And now here it comes. Therefore, and you always know when it's coming, therefore, so he's, he's bringing a point. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. As you receive Christ Jesus, the same way that you receive Christ Jesus your Lord, so also walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. And then he goes on, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to the human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of this world, and not according to Christ. There is a lot in there. And I just want to give you a little bit of a backdrop. When, when the Apostle Paul was writing the, the letter to the Col Colossians, it was a city in ancient Turkey. And it's kind of like a, a, around the coastline, but a little bit inland. And if you know something uh, about the Roman culture, all ways lead to Rome. You ever heard that saying? So they built Rome, the, the Via Appia, Via uh, something... I forgot all the names already. We actually uh, walked on one of the roads. They're really cool. You can see the cobblestones. And, and we knew this was the road that the Apostle Paul walked on. 
just, just, to, just to walk on that road and to sit there for, for a while and just look at the old Roman ruins and just look at the road and thinking, the Apostle Paul must have walked this road. It's, it's really incredible. So the Romans, they just built Romes all over the, the ancient empire uh, because they wanted to create highways uh, for, for um, trade. So all the people were coming just from, from the ancient east, they were coming from the south, from the north, from, from the west, from all directions, and all roads were slowly leading to Rome. And in Rome, then you had all the, the, the roads leading together to, to the city center. And Colossians, or the, the, the city of Colossia, is, was located on one of those roads. It was going right through the city. And it was a city center. And so Colossian was one of, the, one of the cities, it was literally a spiritual hotspot, you could, you could say. It was a spiritual hotspot for every doctrine and religion and philosophy that somehow came from the East. So you had the Roman Empire, you had Turkey here, and everything from India and from, from Russia and everything from there just came and it was like this hotspot, this, this, this high road, the highway, the conduit for all sorts of philosophy and doctrine in the ancient world that kind of just flooded into the, the Roman Empire. And it, so Platonism was really high, Stoicism and Aristotelianism and all the kinds of isms that you could possibly think of. And so here is the Apostle Paul and he's actually writing the letter uh, to that town while he is imprisoned in Rome, and he's dispatching uh, to, to Hikidas and Onesimus, and there, you probably heard them, uh, the Bible story of Onesimus, and so he's sending those two fellows with a letter in their hand uh, to go to the city, and not only to that city, but then to also, once they have read the letter, to copy it and then to send it around to the other cities so that they would also have something from the correspondence. Um, and when he wrote the letter, he wrote very strongly with the spiritual background in mind. Because he knew that Colossians was just like this hot spot of spiritual influence from all sorts of, the, uh, of, of um, influences. You had like Persian magic papyri coming from Persia. It's like they have found this magic papyri that were written. And then if you just read those, you get, if you just get the formula right, then you will have a blessed life. Then you will have something in your life, or there's going to be a breakthrough in your life, or something. Or you, um, you, maybe you will not be barren anymore, and you will have children. So there was a lot of this. Did you ever? Were you ever confronted with magic? We live today in a society that's just so full with magic. It's it's unreal. I mean, you, all you have to do is um, back in back in Austria and Vienna, uh, even our little kids. Uh, when my, my older brother, his kids were a little bit older, he had two girls, and were just sitting in front of the TV, they were watching Barbie movie, right? I mean, just when you think about it, it's a Barbie movie. How bad can a Barbie movie be, you know? But then when you look at it, I was like, I was disgusted by it because there's all about magic potions and spells and something, and then they're, they're being transformed, and I was like, this is not right. It's not right to show it to our children and to introduce them to everything about magic. I mean, hello, and what, what kind of society are we living? And this is how the world is, some, is like indoctrinating our kids and getting them familiarized with something that is supernatural, but that is not God, that is not Jesus. And there's just, just be, always be cautious about that. And then there's something else that went on back there too from Persia, that's like astrology. Um, uh, you remember the, the story when Jesus was born, the astrology, the Magus from the East came. They were not Christian back then. There were Magus from the East that came from the East and because they saw it in the stars. And they believed that the entire history and the future of the human race and of, of, the, of, of eschatology, everything that happens with this world is already pre-written in the stars. And so you can read it just like an open book. And they were believing in that. Um, I, I remember w uh, my work colleagues... Uh, back in Europe, when we were sitting on a table, we had just this really cheap newspaper, and toward the back, there was always the horoscope. You know what a horoscope is? Just like about, your, what, what is your star sign? What is this? You know, and, 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 then, uh, and then they were just reading. It's like, oh yeah, today I have to be careful to not meet so-and-so, and not to meet somebody who is born in that time range. And it's like, what, 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 what uh, star sign are you? And I'm like, mm. <laughs> 
I don't believe in, 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 in the power of stars. I believe in the one who created the stars. Amen. And so we, but it's like it, we, our society is full with that. So it's like what Paul is writing here to, to the Colossians um, is not anything that happened 2,000 years ago. We live today in a society um, that, that's exactly the same way. Even more so, we have it in the newspaper. Our kids are being introduced in the schools already. Hey, I brought today with me a Ouija board. You just want to play with that. Should we just play it? It's like there's some magic there. It's dangerous, you know? We don't want our kids to be introduced to magic, to, uh, to magical things. We, want, we believe. I mean, if you have been here during our time of VBS... Our kids can be spirit-filled, amen? Our kids can be filled with the presence of God and to feel the touch of God, to feel the love of Christ in their life. That's what we want our kids to be filled with and not anything else. But it just shows us that there is a within, innate within us. In, in humanity is a fascination with the supernatural. And, and that is okay. Because that's exactly how God has created us. See, when God created, just, just, just think of it, when God created Adam and Eve, he created them from, from, from clay, right? And from, from the dust of the earth. And then God says he breathed in them. We were, con we were created, uh, if you want to take it literally, if you want to take it as symbolism, but God created us as a vessel to contain the spirit of God. So there will always be a fascination within us uh, that, that wants, wants to link with a higher power, that wants to link with God, that makes us interested in God. And one of the things, too, if we don't fill that void in us, if we don't fill the fascination with God, we're going to be filled with something else. And so we rather have us filled with God. We rather want to come to church, to stand in worship, and let's just, just, just ask God for more and more, and God does not. The Bible says when you ask God, when you ask him for something, he's not going to give you something evil. When, when a kid knows how to ask the father for bread, he's not going to give him stones or a snake or something. Jesus is saying that. When we ask our father for more, he's not going to give us anything else. He's giving us more of his spirit. And so when Paul is writing the letter to a society that is drenched in in just these philosophies and speculations, and they all come from somewhere. In here, in verse eight, uh, they're all founded on the elemental spirits of the world, and uh, according to human tradition, and according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. So it's like there's basic principles, and instead of believing in the basic principles, he urges the Colossians that they should just believe in the principle of Jesus Christ. And as he's doing that. He is saying one verse that's uh, where I just want to dive into this morning, and that's verse 6 here. And I just want to read it again because that is literally my sermon outline. I love it when the sermon outline is right here in the Bible. So open up your sermon outlines. It's in verse 6, and this is where it says, Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. That's point number one. We're supposed to walk. In him, in the same way that we received it. Point number two, rooted in him. And point number three, built up in him. And there is something in there. Number one, when Paul is urging us that we're just in the same way, and it says, as you receive Christ, which basically means what? In the same fashion, in the exactly same way that we receive Christ, not any other way, not any trained way or uh, something that somebody else taught us or something, but when we first were introduced to Jesus Christ, when we first felt the touch of Jesus Christ in our life, how did that happen? It usually happened on our inner knees or on our knees in repentance, when we knew that whatever we do in our life must pass away, and there is no strength in us that can save us. And so we're coming to Jesus and he's saving us and we come to Jesus on our knees. Two weeks ago I was preaching about, or three weeks ago maybe already, uh, about the, the repentance and how repentance is the key that unlocks the fullness of God. Do you remember that? It's not anything else. It's not tradition. It's not moralism. It's not do this and do that. It is repentance. 
that unlo- we can know everything about this cross, the whole doctrine about the cross, but unless we come with repentance, we will never unleash the full power of the cross in our life. And we're not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power, there is power in the cross, there is power in, in, in the gospel, in Jesus Christ, for everyone to be saved. And we believe in that. And it happens through repentance. And as we, and so this is how we got to know Jesus Christ, through repentance. And this is what Paul is saying, just as you received the Lord, so also walk in Him. So what he's basically encouraging us is that we are supposed to live this lifestyle. But there is a little nuance here too, because when he's using the word to walk in Him, the Greek term for it is peripateo, but what it means, it has three connotations. It has three aspects to it. The Greek word, it, has, uh, it implies motion, it implies direction, and it implies progress. I love that. You know, when we walk in Jesus Christ, first of all, it talks about that there, it implies motion. It, it's not stale. When, when we walk in Christ, see, when, when, we, when we come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, something is set in motion. We can no longer sit on our couch or watch TV and just say, oh, hallelujah, we're saved. What's on TV right now? <laughs> you know? There is something. You know, when Jesus touches our life, there is something that he wants to do in our life. So he's setting something in motion in us. And there is a second thing where it also says that the term implies a direction. Gosh, I love that. It's like not only is it implying motion, it is implying a direction. Okay? He's it's like to walk in Jesus Christ. It implies a movement. And it implies a direction. And the third one is progress. Actually, walking, gosh, I feel so dorky here. I'm probably going down in history as the dorkiest pastor of Riverside. <laughs> but this is for your sake, okay? This, this, is, this is when the Apostle Paul writes, and he says, we are supposed to walk in Jesus Christ. As we received him, so walk in him. And the walk is emotion. Not stale, but to move. There is a movement. We are supposed to move. He wants to, us to do something. And it has a direction. When, when, when Christ is doing something in our life, we, we, we are not without orientation. You know, there is a goal that He wants us to walk toward. It's the fullness. He wants us to march towards something. And there is a direction that once we align with Jesus Christ, we feel like that He wants that there is a purpose. All of a sudden, it's like there's a purpose coming. Right? Do you, do you, like, I always explain a prayer through the compass that I have in my office when, through counseling. I'm a counseling pastor too. So when somebody comes and I have a compass, and the nice thing about the compass is when you shake it, you know, what does the needle do? It's just all around, right? And then so I, and that's, that's how I explain prayer. When, when you pray, you calm down, right? And what happens then to the needle? It, it, it idles in somewhere. It idles in toward where it senses. What, what the magnetic north is. And that's exactly what happens inside of us. As we are settling down, as we come, as we focus in, in Jesus Christ, do away with all the distractions of the world. And we have so many, of, we have so plenty of the distractions, but once we do away with that, all of a sudden we feel His presence. But not only presence, that someone set something in motion, also we feel like that there is a direction. And then the third implication is that there is progress. See, when we look back to our life, and it was the same last year, we should rethink it. If our life has not moved forward from exactly what it was three years ago, or five years ago, or from the moment when we were saved, Paul, um, later on in his letters, he, he talks so much about the maturity you know, I, I, I cannot give you the, full, the, the fullness of everything that I want to say because you're still on a... There is a process. There is a progress. God wants us to grow up in Him. God wants us to come to, the, to the, all the riches there are, are, all the knowledge and the wisdom are in Jesus Christ. That implies that we can get to know Him, that there is something that we can have more of Him. So when we are supposed to walk in Him, He encourages us, and he says, there must be emotion. When we're stale, we're not in motion anymore. We have to be in motion and then to get the direction again. 
and also progress. So just as the same way that we receive Christ, we're also supposed to walk in Him. And then the second part is, and being rooted, being rooted and built up in Him and established in faith. He, the Apostle Paul is using here two word images. I already gave you one too um, with the motion. The second image is that of planting. Rooted in Christ. And literally, the term that he's using is actually a tree planting term. Did you ever plant the tree? You know, the roots are small and you have to water it really well. You know, you just water the hole first and you set the, 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 the little knob, you know, of, of the root system that's tied together um, into it and then you just bury it so that it doesn't disrupt the, the flow inside the tree. It's the, the picture that the Apostle Paul uses is really fascinating to me because it's, he talks about rooted in Christ. And this is all stuff going on under the surface. You hearing me? It's under the surface. This is the stuff that's going on when nobody sees it. This under the surface is not the Sunday stuff. When we come to church and with a smile on our face and we're looking at everybody and we're greeting everybody, this is the stuff that's going on in the home. The way that we talk to our children, the way that we talk to our spouses, what we're zapping through in the channels on TV, what, what, what we're looking on our, on our phones. This is the stuff that's going on, the way that our prayer life looks in private. This is all the stuff that's going on under the surface. And the, the cool thing about it is, Whatever this root system looks like is determining how the thing above the surface looks like. See, I was never really the best um, in school with uh, mathematics. Gosh, don't ask me about it. But I was the top two. I was always t top one or top two, and I always competed with another guy in class in biology. I love biology. For some reason, I really love bio biology. But one of the things that I remember from biology is the picture of the tree. How under the surface by a tree, there's the circulation system going from nutrition, going into the root system, and then it's going up into, you know, you have the stem, and then you have the crown. Is it the crown in English? In German, we say the crown, right? Crown. I just say crown. <laughs> um, so you have the crown. And then and the whole thing circulates. The whole thing is a circulation. If, actually, if you cut in the stem, the tree dies because you, you cut through the circulation. But one of the things that is important is the tree up above, above the surface, will only ever be as strong when the storm comes how deep the root system is. And when you look at it from like top and under the surface, the proportions between the root system and the tree above the ground are the same. You can literally look at the tree in the field somewhere and you can imagine as, as tall as the crown is, as deep the root system is. As wide as the crown is, as wide the root system is. It's really interesting. You know, back in Austria, the up, upper Austria uh, was called the, the, the forest uh, quarter of Austria because we had so many oak trees. Uh, the whole country, and during the Middle uh, Ages, Medieval ages, uh, there was the glass industry, so it came. And so they harvested all the oak trees and just used it, you know, for, for the furnaces to produce glass. And they had to replant trees after a while, because you cannot just cut trees, you have to replant them. But they re replanted it with the kind of trees that grow really fast. The pine trees, right? They grow really fast, they come up really fast, and then they grow larger. But the root system, um, the, the different kinds of pine, but the one that I talk about is the one with the shallow roots. Do you know what I'm talking about? And then when the wind comes, you kind of see like all the root systems come above the ground. And this is what happens. Nowadays, when, when there is a big wind coming through that region, you have just this worse damage, forest damage, and, and the, 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 the tree stems and the trees are just literally they're falling over and the, the root system is coming out from the ground. See, what, at, when the storm comes, and it's never a question if a storm comes, there, the, oh, a storm will always come. But when the storm comes, what will determine if a tree stands is the root system. And when the Apostle Paul here talks about being rooted in Christ 
And he again, two weeks ago or three weeks ago, I talked about this term that he's using, an established fact in the past, accomplished task, completely done. The way that he rooted us in Christ, God rooted us in Christ, and it's established. And that way that we are rooted in Christ is going to determine how we grow in life how strong we are in life. That when the winds and the storm of life are all around us, the way that we are rooted in Christ will determine if we fall over or if we stand. Amen? So one of the things that we have to do is when, when you realize that, that you're not being rooted correctly in Christ, and maybe it's hard to, like, how, what does it mean to be rooted in Christ? And I just want to give you a different verse here. In Ephesians 3, Chapter, uh, Ephesians chapter 3, 17. He uses the same term here in Greek. And it says, So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. Being rooted and grounded in love. See, when the Apostle Paul wrote this to the Colossians, he knew from, from the letter of Ephesians, which he also dispatched at the same time, uh, when, when he talks, his concept of about being rooted in Christ means being rooted in the love of Christ. Rooted and grounded in the overwhelming love that God has shown us in Jesus Christ. And in this love of Jesus Christ, this is where we are we're established. This is where we are rooted. See, when storms of life happen for you and you feel like you cannot withstand it, check your root system. Check your root system if you're rooted in the love of Christ. Who of you knows that sometimes we face challenging people in our life? <laughs> we do, right? If we don't have the love of Christ for them in our life, if we harbor resentment or bitterness or something, we're not living and exercising the love of Christ in our life. There's something, there's something faulty with the root system. And then when the storms of life come, we're not strong enough to stand. We have to be rooted, and we have to draw the nutrition from the ground through our, our root system, and that is the love of Christ. We have to be rooted daily in the love of Christ and go back to this. Christ wants us to grow up to full maturity of the statue of Christ. This is what Paul writes in Ephesians. We are supposed to grow, and the growth happens through our root system. So we have to be rooted correctly. And then the other term that he is using is where he's saying build up. Rooted and build up in him and established in faith. So now he uses a different term, and that's a term of construction, of literally house building. That, that's a term in the Greek that's used for constructing a castle or something, a house. It's for building, constructing something. I had to, to call uh, Jesse Utek during the week and ask, so when you're building a house, how long does it take? <laughs> and he told me, I mean, this guy's a super fast. If you ever need a house built, I don't want to do commercial. <laughs> I know this guy is swamped anyway. But anyway, they're building a house like in anything between 8 and 10 days. It, it's incredible. But I asked him, how long does it take uh, for the foundation of the house to be built? And he said, you know, kind of like a, around the same time. You first dig it out, you, pour the, the, you, you measure it out, you dig it out, and then you, you, you pour the, the, the foundation. You build the foundation, you fill it with concrete, and then you get it back together again. And then you build on top of that, right? The interesting thing about it is, when you construct, when you build a house on that foundation, it never is wider or larger than the foundation, right? Because otherwise, well, what do you build a foundation for? It's in the middle. You can put a swimming pool on top of it in the middle of a house. You, you literally, the extent of your house, the extent of the, when Paul uses this image, build up, we are the house of God. We ourselves are the house of God, and we as church are the house of God, and we are built up to a full image of what the house is supposed to look like. And that has to stand on a foundation, a firm foundation. That reminds me, Jesse, maybe we can end with the song, Firm Foundation, afterward. Get ready for it. 
But when the Apostle Paul is saying something that we're being built up in him, there's something that I want you to see. He uses that same term in Acts 20, 32. Acts 20, 32. First it says, therefore be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease neither day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. I com- now I just, char- I, I just release you into the power of, I, re- I give you to God and to the word, to the word of his grace. I give you over to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up, same terminology, to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. See, when Paul is talking about somebody being built up, when Paul is talking about our personal lives being built up, it talks about progress, right? I mean, when you build a house, I remember when, when Jesse once said, when he's building a house, it's kind of nice because uh, first, you know, just put up the, 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 the rafters or whatever it's called. Maybe that comes later. I have no idea about it. But you just put up the sides. But at one point, it kind of starts looking like a house. That's nice. And there is a process. There is a progress. And it looks better every day. And when it's your house, you come and visit the construction site. And slowly you enjoy it. It's like it looks, starts looking like my house. First, it just looks like a pile of of dirt, but slowly it's being built up. And when the Apostle Paul is is saying here is the way that we are being built up is through the word of grace. It's through the word of grace. Listen, how this is not just the book. It's not just a novel. See, God has given us the word of grace. And he's giving this to us so that we can feed on it, that we can feast on it, that we can, this is our nourishment. This is what's nourishing us. Our love in Christ, where do we get it? We also get it from the word of grace. See, when my brother came to the Lord at men's breakfast, I once shared it. Uh, When he came to the Lord, um, I didn't find the Bible anymore that I stole from him first because he didn't use it because he didn't believe in God anyway. But all of a sudden, my Bible was gone, and I walked into his room, and there he was with, my Bible, with his Bible, actually. And so he was just reading and literally devouring his Bible. And, 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 and I could tell his life changed. God did something. One day, I'm going to share that story. But God did something in his life, and he, he wanted to know more. He wanted to know more. And so he was just literally eating up that book the Bible, chapter for chapter for chapter, and it was just nourishing his soul. And after three months, he got a call. It's like, <laughs> I got to do something with all this. This is good. And he got a call on his heart that he should go to a, to a seminary, to a Bible school. And God called him into ministry. But this is what God has provided for us as we're being built up in faith. The, we are being built up through the word of his grace. The, when, we, when we're spending time in the word, then it feeds us. It's interesting because in the times when we stop growing, those are the times when we stop reading our Bibles. The Bible remains closed somehow, and we just don't open it up anymore. We're just, nah, just not interested in it anymore. And of course, the enemy just gives us all the other interests and to but then once we get a touch of God again, or if we want to rekindle this fire in us, we just go to the Word again. And maybe in the, in the beginning, we have to convince ourselves to do that. But once you start opening it up, and even if you just go through the genealogies and stuff, it's like, but still, the Spirit of God is there. And it does something inside of us. And it gets us back, like this compass, it just gets us back in tune with the living God, in tune with the voice of the Spirit that's just constantly working on us. And this is the picture that God has given us here through the letter that we're, and I'm calling the sermon, rooted and built up. Because as we're going into this fall, I, I believe that what we have to, where we have to start is with ourselves. We have to be rooted in the love of Christ 
And we have to be built up by his word, by his faithfulness. We want to uh, have more of God. We want to be a church that experiences God, that allows God through the presence of his Holy Spirit to work on our lives, to speak into our lives, and to do something. And when the Holy Spirit is putting his thumb on something, that we listen to it and that we go ahead and, uh, and follow him in obedience because obedience always locks, unlocks the next step in our life. I really want to do that. Jesse, can we do that? Maybe just sing that song? I just want us to, to prepare our hearts um, just in, in this song that God is our firm foundation. And we have talked about like our, our root system carries our life. And however strong our foundation, what we do under the surface, however strong that is, determines if we can last when the storm is coming. And so right now, I just want us to, we have a little bit of time, but I just want to encourage you, just soak in the song. Just sing the song with all your heart and just believe it that Christ Jesus is your firm foundation. On no other ground you want to build that foundation because every other ground is what? Is sinking sand, right? We want to build our life on the firm foundation of Jesus Christ, rooted and grounded in the love, the overwhelming, overpowering love of Christ in our life. When we're getting in touch with the love of Christ, it does something to us. If somebody says, oh yes, I know something about the love of Christ, but their lives remain untouched by it, they have not yet felt the love of Christ in their life. Because when you feel the love of Christ in your life, it does something to you. It doesn't leave you the same way. And that's the starting point. That's the starting point. That's where it starts, but then God wants to build us up. And we want to submit. We want to be... We want to be in motion. We want to, want to be directed toward what God has for our life. And we want to see a progress in our life. Amen? Let us all stand together. I know if you have the song up. Sing worthy. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe to live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Sing holy. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none besides you. Open up my eyes and wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those who around me. Thank you, Lord. You are worthy. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. To live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Oh, we live for you. Sing holy, holy. There is no one like you. There is none besides you. Open up my eyes and wonder. Show me who you.
Jesus, Jesus, this is our prayer, that we're not being rooted with shallow roots in our life, but that our roots are firmly grounded and going deep into your love. Jesus, my prayer is for our congregation this morning, would you just each one of us root deeply, give us a deeper understanding of your love, ground us in your overwhelming presence, in your overwhelming love for our lives. We thank you for everything that you have done in our lives. Make us aware of it when we forget it. And root us, Father. We know that the storms of life are coming. And that we will only be able to stand when we are rooted in you, Jesus. Do your work in us, Father, and build us up. Help us not to be ignorant about the way that we go about our life. The things that we are seeing, Father, the way that we feed ourselves, we just want to feed ourselves, Father, on your word, the word of grace, the word of grace that's life-changing, that changes our life. Build us up. Root us deeply, Father, and build us up to be the house of God, to be the vessels that contain your spirit, we pray. We thank you for your sweet presence this morning. We thank you, Father, and we will look with excitement toward this fall. As we're launching off this fall, we, we want to launch it with you. Father, we want to give you all the room in this church. We want to see more and more of you in this church. Change our lives. Change our lives. Start with us, Father, and use us to change the lives around us. We give ourselves to you. And work in us, Father, through the presence of your Spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Yes, give God a hand. God is good. Well, as we're going into our fall, just, just keep that in mind. There's, there's more coming in these weeks to come. And I just believe God just wants to start uh, in us. He just doesn't want to leave us the same way. There should be a progress in our life. Amen? There's more. There's always more. It's, it's just so overwhelming. There's always more of God. And we would just want to plunge right into it.